Welcome to Josie to Lagos. This is a podcast for Africa from Africa. Why? Why not? We actually need this kind of content. We need to be able to get perspective from Africans on the ground, giving clear information, accurate information, and really being part of telling the African story. The African story has been told for far too long from the lens of Europe, from the lens of America, from the lens of Asia, but not as aggressively and accurately from the lens of Africa. This podcast is going to be part of telling the African story, making sense of Africa from an African perspective. And that's really what our goal is going to be. And we're going to try to like piece through a very important underlying question. Why is Africa not performing at full potential? Why is Africa not enjoying peace, prosperity, and power? And why are we living in poverty, confusion, mismanagement, misadministration, and miseducation? That's really what this podcast is going to try to unpack over the coming weeks and months and hopefully years. So I'm the host of this particular podcast. My name is Mighty Jamie. I'm an independent Africa analyst. I studied law at Wits University, and I also furthered my studies by going to Wits Business School. My passion for Africa actually came from my involvement with the university debating. I was part of the university debating team. And one of the things that we would do is compete at an African level in a competition called the Pan-African Universities Debating Championships. So you would have to travel to different Af- African countries and spend up to maybe two weeks in that particular space in a debate competition. So we travel to Nigeria, to Ghana, to Namibia, to Botswana, to Cameroon, to name but a few. And when you get to those universities, you get to see the continent and And because the competition was low budget, you really would get to see it not from a tourist perspective, but from the perspective of the young African students who were learning at those institutions because they would be the ones hosting us. And you would spend time discussing with young African scholars from Burundi, Rwanda, Togo, Tanzania, Kenya, the Gambia, and, you know, spending time developing relationships with all of those people, you can't help but fall in love with the continent and start thinking critically about the challenges that the continent is facing. So if you're wondering, why does he care so much? Why does he love Africa? Why does he want to speak on this particular subject matter? That's the reason. It's simply because I fell in love with the continent as a university debater. And this is a conversation that I wanted to continue beyond my university debating days. So that's the motive behind the existence of this particular podcast. So today we're going to be talking about the other crisis that is facing Africa outside of COVID-19. You know, everybody admits that at some point COVID-19 will pass, but there's this one issue that may remain for a longer period of time than COVID-19. So there are two disasters that we saw last year and this year, which actually are worth examining and looking at critically. Number one, we've been seeing a lot of flooding that has been happening in East Africa. We've also been seeing the emergence of desert locusts across East Africa. In January this year, there was a swarm of locusts that was so large that an Ethiopian airline flight had to actually change course because it could not actually fly through that particular swarm of locusts. We've seen the worst infestation of locusts that we've ever seen for 25 years in Somalia. The worst locust infestation that has ever been seen for 70 years in Kenya. And the implications of those locust infestations are that more than 25 million people are facing the risk of famine and starvation this year. So while COVID is killing a lot of people in Africa, a bigger killer could actually be famine. In Kenya, in the province of West Pokot, we saw that many people were being killed by floods, by mudslides, and this was happening in South Sudan, it was happening in Ethiopia, it was happening in several other countries in East Africa. So the floods have been killing people, they've been destroying roads and infrastructure, they've been destroying people's homes in villages all around East Africa, and they've been killing people. So in the middle of COVID, there's been this other issue that has been a massive issue across the continent. And that's something that we're going to be discussing. What's causing this? What's pushing this? And what can the African Union do to deal with this particular crisis? So 
So to understand all of these weather developments, you need to actually be very familiar with the events that are happening in the Indian Ocean. The Indian Ocean is the third largest ocean in the world. It is the warmest ocean of the three oceanic blocks. It has Asia in the north, East Africa in the west, Australia in the east. So just think about the top end. You're dealing with countries such as India, Pakistan, Yemen, and Iran. So that's the top end. You know, you're dealing with the Arab Peninsula, those kind of countries. On the African end, you're dealing with Ethiopia, Somalia, Kenya, Sudan, South Sudan, Djibouti, those kind of countries. So try to visualize it if you can. Now, the Indian Ocean is a climate driver, right? And, and it's important for us to discuss the difference between climate and weather at this particular point. Weather is the day-to-day -day snapshot, temperature, rain, cloud cover, wind, humidity. So that's the day-to-day maybe even week or month conditions of the environment. But the climate is the long-term prevailing weather in an area, and it's largely determined by temperature and precipitation. So the Indian Ocean is a climate driver, and the largest climate driver in the Indian Ocean itself is this phenomena that they call the Indian Ocean Dipole, right? So the Indian Ocean basically has two poles of temperature. One side is warmer and the other side is colder. And they basically in geography divide where the predominance is um, in phases. So there's something which is called a negative phase, a neutral phase, and a positive phase. To understand this, when the Indian Ocean is in a positive phase of the dipole, right, the, the warm water is on the African side of the Indian Ocean. When it's a when it's in a negative phase, the warm water is on the Australian side of the Indian Ocean. So try to visualize it the way you would the poles of a magnet. You remember the magnet, if you remember your science lessons, basically has two different poles, right? And that's basically how the Indian Ocean is. It's kind of like a temperature magnet. One side is warm, the other side is cool. Now, what has been happening is that the Indian Ocean has been in a positive phase. And what this means is that there's more warm water on the African side, on that East African coast. Wherever there's warm water, there's also low pressure. So when you combine the fact that there's low pressure and that there's warm water, there's more evaporation happening on the East African coastlines as well as in the Arab uh, Peninsula. So as a result of that uh, positive phase of the Indian Ocean Dipole, there has been more rainfall and that rainfall has articulated itself in floods. It has articulated itself in hurricanes. In fact, there have been several hurricanes which have been very, very extreme in the last two years. The period between 2018 and 2020 has seen more extreme water patterns in the Southern Asia bracket, Arab Peninsula, Southern Asia, as well as in East Africa. So the result of that is that you get these massive floods in Kenya, South Sudan, Ethiopia. Because of those floods, you then have mudslides because there's just so much water that it actually creates a mudslide. And the mudslide is the reason why you then see the destruction of property. Now, the other result of this particular flooding is that when it happens in desert areas, deserts then get way more water than they've ever received before. And as a result of that, the desert becomes lush in certain areas. What we saw is that in one of the deserts in Yemen, the Rubahali Desert, what actually happened is that lakes were actually forming, small lakes were forming in the desert during this cyclone period. So the cyclone periods would start off in May and then there'd also be other cyclone periods in October and November. As a result of this, we started seeing a phenomena that had to do with the locusts. The desert locust is a type of grasshopper. They can be found in that dry area in Northwest Africa to Western Asia, you know, where you've got all of these deserts in Egypt, in Yemen, Saudi Arabia, that very dry area. That's where these 
desert locusts can be found, their life cycle is relatively simple. They move from being an egg to a hopper before they can fly to an adult. And normally, they're in what is called the solitary phase. So they only meet up with other locusts to mate because it's dry, they aren't a lot of crops or anything that they can eat. So these particular desert locusts aren't found in high numbers. But as an area grows lush, as an area starts developing plants that they can eat, what these locusts start to do is that they start congregating and then they enter what is called a gregarious phase. The gregarious phase is totally different to the solitary phase. The actual locusts actually go through a metamorphosis as a result of the hormones that are released in their system. They actually change color. They move from being brown to bright yellow. Their body actually shrinks and their brain goes. Their brain actually grows in size. They become smarter when they are in a collective. And they're able to collectivize now in deserts because guess what? It's been flooding in the deserts. So there are many different oases that have been forming. When they enter this uh, gregarious phase, they become hectic to the environment around them because they ride the wind and they fly to different spaces and they basically eat everything inside in sight and they breed as much as possible. So these actual locusts can fly 150 kilometers a day. That basically means they can travel the distance of South Africa in the space of 12 days. From Limpopo to Cape Town, they can do that in 12 days. That's how fast they are. And they move in swarms of billions. The actual largest sighting that has been cited was a sighting of 2,400 square kilometers. And in that uh, square kilometer uh, range, there are 150 million locusts per square kilometer. So imagine how many um, locusts you can have in a 2,400 square kilometer canvas of locusts. You've got 150 million of them in a square kilometer. It's crazy. Billions and billions of locusts have been ravaging. Just to put it in perspective, that 2,400 square kilometer size of the locusts, Johannesburg is 1,645 square kilometers. Lagos is 1,171 square kilometers. Accra is 2,257 square kilometers. So depending on which of those cities you're most familiar with, imagine a swarm of locusts the size of Johannesburg, bigger actually than Johannesburg, a swarm of locusts the size of Accra moving across the country at a pace where they can move across the whole of South Africa in the space of 12 days. That's what has been ravaging many countries, Somalia, Kenya, Uganda, parts of Ethiopia. These locusts are causing chaos, but not only chaos in Africa, they are also causing the same level of chaos in Pakistan, in India, and other countries in Southeast Asia. All of the countries basically that are adjacent to the Indian Ocean. So the question at this point can reasonably be, why is the Indian Ocean in a positive phase? Why has this been happening? And the simple answer is global warming. Now, if you're not familiar with global warming, basically the sun's rays come into the earth, but they don't come out as much anymore because of the greenhouse gases. So the greenhouse gases include carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and chlorofluorocarbon, CFCs. So those gases trap heat within the atmosphere. And most of that heat actually is transferred to the Indian Ocean. So the Indian Ocean is capturing most of the heat. And as a result of that increase in temperature, it is remaining in the positive phase for much longer. Another interesting phenomena associated with this positive phase of the Indian Ocean dipole is that Australia doesn't receive as much rainfall as it is used to. So Western Australia in particular. And if you remember, there was a lot of news coverage around the fires that were occurring in West Australia. That is related to the Indian Ocean dipole 
being in the positive phase. So global warming is the reason why we've been seeing this particular phenomenon. So when people talk about climate change and how it affects things, this is one of the effects that are being observed, not only in East Africa, but also in Southern Asia and the Arab Peninsula, but also in Australia. All of it is all related. And the irritating thing is that these areas are not the areas which have been contributing the most to the problem, right? With the exception of maybe Australia. If you think about the consumption patterns, methane gas is produced because of the consumption of beef and beef farming. So when you consume beef, right, you have to farm the beef and that involves you keeping all of these cattle. Now cattle release methane gas as part of their digestive process. So either through flatulence or through burping, they release methane gas and methane gas is one of the gases that actually traps um, you know, the atmospheric heat even better than carbon dioxide. So the farming of beef and lamb is actually contributing to the global warming effect. In fact, some studies have said that it contributes up to 28%. The rest comes from the consumption of fossil fuels, either through the generation of electricity or the driving of cars. We don't have a lot of cars in Africa. There are a lot of cars in Africa, but they are not a lot in comparison to the other regions of the world. So the number of cars being driven in America, in Europe, is contributing to the release of these uh, carbon emissions. The burning of coal is contributing to the release of these carbon emissions. So Africa is suffering from a problem that they didn't play a role in creating. In fact, the contribution that Africa is making is almost minuscule to the carbon dioxide emissions that are globally produced. The world produces 33 billion metric tons of carbon dioxide per year. 33 billion metric tons. The biggest contributors are China, which produces 9.8 billion metric tons. The United States of America, which produces 5.3 billion metric tons. But Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa specifically, produces 0 0.7 billion metric tons. So we're not making a major dent in um, the contribution of carbon dioxide emissions. However, we are suffering uh, disproportionately from the harms. We've seen that 25 million people are facing famine in East Africa as a result of the extreme weather patterns caused by the positive phase of the Indian Ocean Dipole, which is caused by increased global warming patterns, which are caused by the increased production of greenhouse gases. Another factor that is going to disproportionately affect Africa is the displacement of people. The United Nations projects that 50 million people are going to be displaced as a result of global warming and climate change. Millions of that 50 million are going to come from places like Africa, where people are being forced to move um, out of certain areas because of the extreme weather conditions. What we saw in Kenya in that West, West Pokot province, where floods and mudslides occurred is that many people were discouraged from going back to their ancestral villages to the places where they had been living because the extreme weather that we've been discussing was going to continue leading to their lives being at risk their homes at risk and creating an expense in building infrastructure that kenya just simply cannot be able to afford so we are in africa adversely and disproportionately affected. But what is the African Union doing about the impact? African Union is currently not doing enough, but it's not too late. We need to move away from this approach, which is basically based on going to the global community with the begging bowl, waiting for global community funding to become available to us through institutions such as the UN or other generous benefactors who may feel that there needs to be environmental proactive response in Africa. The African Union needs to be proactive 
and stop behaving like a child at the negotiating table. What does that entail? Number one, the African Union needs to develop its own continental environmental fund. We cannot continue to wait for China, for America, for the United Nations to bail us out if we do not have the requisite capacity ourselves. In 2019, we saw Cyclone Idai, we saw Cyclone Kenneth ravage Southern Africa. And it was the Chinese who had to come through and rebuild roads in Mozambique, rebuild bridges in Mozambique. That cannot continue to be the way of handling things. Africa needs to come together, put money aside for disasters such as this so that we don't have to wait for the largesse of other countries to deal with these crises. Number two, Africa actually needs to start promoting its own research into electric vehicle technology. We can't wait on Tesla. We can't wait on Ford. That's the recurrent theme in this part of the, the podcast is that we cannot be lying back waiting for developments from the rest of the world. Let's show some innovation. Let's fund certain departments at universities across the continent to see what they can contribute to the electric energy conversation from a vehicle uh, perspective because that's one of the drivers of carbon emissions and we should not be one of the countries participating in that as Africa develops. It's no secret that Africa is industrializing very slowly and is trying to catch up with the rest of the world but we can't catch up with the rest of the world on the terms of old development. We have to pursue new pathways to attaining lifestyles similar to that. So if we want to be able to move around freely it cannot be on the basis of of gas-driven cars. We need to reconsider how our mobility is navigated and we need to do so very fast. We can't rely on Elon Musk and other companies. Number three, Africa needs to develop its hydropower generation capacity. Now, there have been interesting examples of uh, the generation of hydropower by some countries as part of this new path for African development, NEPAD, you know, Ethiopia has built this dam, which they are calling the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, where they've uh, pulled some water from the Nile and are using it to generate electricity. So it's supposed to go into effect this year in 2020. And it's supposed to have enough power generation capacity, not only to provide power for Ethiopia, but to allow Ethiopia to export power to the rest of the region. That's an interesting project that does allow many countries in East Africa to move away from the production of power on the basis of coal power stations. So the African Union needs to come together with Ethiopia to figure out how do we make sure you provide electricity to the region? How do we increase the capacity whilst protecting the water supply to countries such as South Sudan and Egypt without those countries being heavily taxed and not being able to secure the power themselves? So the challenge that exists is that if Ethiopia is generating power for the region, Ethiopia is a sovereign state. How do you get the right kind of power agreements in the region so that everyone has power, but that power doesn't necessarily come from the generation which comes from the burning of coal? We saw that Kenya attempted in 2019 to open a coal plant, which was um, a coal power plant, but that was blocked by the courts because the area where they were trying to build the power plant was one which was deemed to be important environmentally, important to the coastline, and that the Kenyan government was actually trying to just push through a project which was not environmentally friendly. But how do you actually get Kenya to participate in a power sharing scheme with Ethiopia and abandon its independent power aspirations, which are based on coal. This is where the African Union needs to be showing leadership and we're not seeing enough of it. Another project that is interesting is the Batoka George Dam, the one that is supposed to be built. It's a hydropower a station that is supposed to be built between Zambia and Zimbabwe. And it's supposed to generate over 2,400 megawatts of power to increase the power stability of both countries. Unfortunately, right now, that project is heavily dependent on the support of the Chinese. And that's not something that we should also continue to do and conscience. It's not a good way of creating the right kind of autonomy for the region. However, these kind of projects, which are still in the pipeline, need to be adopted more aggressively by Africa, by African funding instruments. 
We also need to make sure, number four, that Africa puts its own reforesting targets for the region. I don't know if you're aware, I mentioned a bit earlier, 17% of the world's forests are still in Africa. Almost one-fifth of the world's forests are still in Africa. That means that Africa is contributing to being the world's lungs and contributing to keeping this ecosystem uh, alive. So we need to actually make sure that we grow that and not decrease that because some um, actions that have been happening across the region have been such that they've been contributing to deforestation, not reforestation. It's important that Africa is a participant to the reforestation efforts. Now, a lot of this stuff may sound expensive and impossible to do because you're thinking Africa doesn't have money. But I submit to you that Africa can actually crowdfund from the environmental global community and raise a significant amount of money, which is separate from the money that comes from these institutions that is bureaucratic money from the UN, US government, Chinese government. Let us go to the people of the world with a clear environmental package and have the people of the world fund that particular package for the protection of the environment globally. Africa plays a critical role. And lastly, I would say as number five, one of the actions that can be taken by the African Union is this push for environmental reparations environmental reparations. There is a conversation that needs to happen at the United Nations. There's a conversation that needs to happen globally in that if your country was a massive contributor to instability in the environment today, your country actually has to compensate the most adversely affected countries in the world. So if you drive lots of cars, if you burn lots of coal, if you are using industrial processes in a way that emit a large amount of greenhouse gases, it's then important that when those greenhouse gases begin to adversely affect parts of the world, that you uh, foot some of the bill. This is not a conversation that I think will be won overnight, but I do think that we need to start speaking about reparations. I think that there's an overturn window that currently exists that could allow for this conversation to be successful. We're seeing many people now beginning to consider the idea of reparations in and of themselves as valuable and valid. If they're valuable and valid for slavery, if they're valuable and valid for colonialism, if they're valuable and valid for apartheid, why can they not be valuable and valid for the environmental harm that has been caused by countries such as America and China. If you are experiencing a swarm and an infestation of locusts unseen in 70 years, it must be the obligation of America, China, Japan, and other mass polluters to close that particular gap and make sure that you have the funding required to feed your people in the interim. But as I said before, we should not wait for that political victory because these kind of things can take decades at the United Nations and they just simply isn't enough time. Has Africa done enough environmentally? I would submit to you, no. Africa has been relying on the fact that we're not the largest polluters, therefore we don't have to do much. And I think that kind of laid back attitude waiting for leadership from other parts of the world is part of the reason that Africa is in the condition it's in. We cannot continue to operate in that particular fashion. We have to do more. That's really the bottom line. Whether it's floods, whether it's locusts, whether it's droughts, we as Africa need to have our environmental strategy in place. And unfortunately, we have not done enough as things stand to make that happen. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you so much for uh, joining this journey. Josie to Lagos is a growing podcast. And if you have any contributions, I would be more than enthusiastic to go through those contributions with you. You can find the Josie to Lagos podcast on Twitter. There's a Facebook group called Josie to Lagos podcast. You can also just interact with me directly on my own social media accounts, be it on Facebook or Twitter. My name is Mighty Jamie, M-I-G-H-T-I, -I, Jamie like Jamie Oliver. You can find me on all of those platforms. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for being a part of this journey. Till the next episode.